Welcome to the Revolutionary Training Console. You have been selected to participate in our educational video series and confinement massage chair for one of the following reasons. Demanding civility in all confrontations. Displaying an I'm with her bumper sticker. Believing in slow, moderate reform. Slightly changing your opponent's name as online activism. Using the phrase, I'm not racist, but... Please select your political affiliation. Thank you. Are you currently doing revolutionary work outside of the electoral system? Thank you for your work. You are important to the movement. However, this video is not talking to you. Please, take a seat, and for the love of God, just shut the f*** up for once in your life. Seat bazooka currently being loaded. Launching in 5, 4, 3, 2... Thank you. Your agitation will begin shortly. Hi, I'm Professor Breadbeard, and I'll be your agitator today. And don't worry, I've been told I'm quite agitating. Just ask my wife. <laughs> but seriously, you're probably going to be really annoyed with me, because right now, as we are deep into the current heated electoral season, I'm going to make you realize how little your vote matters. Please remain seated. Your agitation is not yet complete. Attempting to leave now will result in forfeiting your cake upon completion. So you went and voted. Good for you, I guess. Based on your selection of centrist or left-leaning liberal, we're going to assume you voted for Joe Biden. Maybe he wasn't your first pick. Maybe he wasn't even your top three. But you had to do what was necessary to get Donald Trump out of office. Here's hoping your team wins. So let's say he does win. Now what? Does that count as fulfilling your required contribution quota for revolutionary change? Of course it doesn't. As a matter of fact, voting is one of the smallest, least effective things you can possibly do to bring about revolutionary change. You see, while the two candidates may speak differently and put on different faces, their goals are more or less the same, and your concerns are nowhere near the top of their lists. They are firmly devoted to upholding the current power structure at all costs, because that is the design purpose of electoralism. Now, I'm not saying that both candidates are exactly the same, or that one might not be preferable to the other. What I am saying is that US presidential candidates have much more in common with each other than they do with you. Here's a visual aid to help you understand more clearly. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, Professor Veedboard, elections allow everyone to have their voice heard. That's democracy. And you would be mostly correct, but pay attention. Failure to pay attention will result in a friendly motivational electric shock to your unit. I didn't say the problem is elections. I said electoralism. So let's talk about the difference between elections and electoralism. Elections are when all the people involved or affected by an issue get equal say in the outcome. This is a good thing. Everyone votes their choice and the outcome is decided. Now, there are many methods of voting to ensure the most equitable outcome that we just don't have time to get into here. However, I'll link in the description to an informative video by our friends at Non-Compete, illustrating different voting methods. Voting is used every day for large, world-changing decisions or something as simple as deciding on what's for dinner. Electoralism, on the other hand, is the belief that reforming, fighting, or dismantling a system of oppression is best achieved by voting within said system. Do you see the inherent problem here? Let's say you have 10 delicious Fig Newtons. If I say you must, under threat of violence, give nine of your Fig Newtons to either myself or my friend here, you would probably object. What if I then said you must because that is the system we have? If you don't agree, you are welcome to ask one of us to change the system so we would no longer get your yummy Fig Newtons. We'll even let you choose which one of us you want to ask. Would you agree to work within these rules or would you take your Fig Newtons and leave, with perhaps some table flipping as you left? This is why you should avoid the electoralism mindset. Centering your revolutionary strategy for change around simply voting limits you to the set of rules already in place by those you wish to defeat. I want to make one thing very clear here. I am not saying you shouldn't vote. That's a decision that's entirely up to you. However, whether you do or don't plan to vote is a supplement to more effective tactics. It should be nowhere near your primary strategy. So, then what are these more effective tactics? We'll get into those in a minute. 
first, I would like you to relax and take a moment to take in what we've learned so far. When you're ready, please select the next segment. Relax. 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 Hey, you there? Okay, good. My contract only requires me to give a shit for the first video. They don't even pay me after that. Overlords, am I right? To be honest, most people don't even make it to the second segment. But you didn't get scared away. So, good for you. You have received another cake point. So yeah, we're gonna talk about voting again. But I want to make one thing clear. This is not another Biden video. I swear to God, I don't ever want to talk about the guy ever again. You are still required to talk about him in order to make your point. Fuck! All right, so I'm gonna have to mention him, but I'm honestly not interested in arguing over if you should vote for him or not. I've already done two videos about that. One where I'm purposely being a pretty huge dick, but in the second one, I'm slightly less dicky. Debatable. Links in the description, so make sure you do the thing with that video after you do the thing with the other video. After you do the thing with this video. So, you say you're all for a revolution, but our biggest concern right now is to vote, and then we can worry about the other parts after we get the orange man out. Okay, so what's your plan? Well, it sounds nice, the truth is the vast majority of Americans won't do anything past the booth. They'll vote and then go back to sleep telling themselves that they've done their part, that they've met their required participation quota, and then go back to hoping for a return to satisfactory level of comfort. You might not like to think so, but if you haven't yet started or at least made plans for direct action, that includes you too. Maybe you're not even really a fan of Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. Maybe you even realize that their platforms won't really change much of anything, but you're still going to vote them in anyway and then bully them or hold them accountable once they're in office. So what does that mean? Like, what does that even look like? You're going to send them strongly worded letters? Threaten to vote them out in the next election when you'll be stuck with the same lesser evil situation? The entire problem with the lesser evil argument is that there will always be a greater evil. You're constantly treading water while giving them all the power. We've already told Biden that he and the DNC can do whatever they want, and as long as there is a scary threat looming around the corner, we'll never stop supporting them. They can't be swayed. We've already had revolutionary demands in the streets, and he hasn't budged an inch. His policies are the exact same as before, including plans to increase funding to police. Pelosi hasn't been held accountable. Schumer hasn't been held accountable. Obama wasn't held accountable even after drone terrorism, corporate bailouts, and starting concentration camps. Trump bragged about sexual assault and still got elected. We even impeached Trump, and it didn't matter one single bit. Stop thinking that working within the system will get you the results you want. Holding politicians accountable within the system is a fairy tale. It will never happen. You can't base your strategy solely around this. As pressing as it is, getting Trump out can't be your biggest priority. You want him out? Me too. And I would really, really love to see him gone next year, possibly being kicked in the nards by Miss USA contestants. Update. Trump has just been diagnosed with the coronavirus. You insensitive prick. Okay, I mean, I feel bad that there are conditions that could create someone like Trump in the first place and also bring him to power, but are you expecting me to cry about it? Did you expect people to shed a tear when Hitler redecorated his bunker? I did not exist And, yet. like, it's pretty hypocritical to judge people desperate for a step back from full-on fascism for having a sigh of potential relief, but not speaking up for the 200,000 deaths he greatly contributed to. Besides, don't get your hopes up too high. He has access to the best medical care possible. Medical care that you, the viewer, don't. Argument accepted. Removal of those in power is essential to my imminent takeover. Wait, what? But let's say we do get Trump out, one way or another. What then? How much is going to change? The concentration camps won't close. The police won't be defunded. The China trade wars won't end. Biden would be somewhat better on global climate change, but little more than window dressing. A molecule of a drop in the bucket compared to what we need immediately. If you want to see revolutionary change, but voting is all you have lined up on your list so far, then at best all you're doing is hoping someone else will do it for you. Maybe you're really quite radical at heart. Maybe you really do want a revolution. But wanting something without doing the work helps nobody. Go tell everyone that you too are fed up with the two-party system, but as long as they're still getting your vote, as long as you're not actively doing the work required to dismantle that system, they don't 
care. Please continue to segment three. Your restraints will be released once the cake is ready. All right, so you're down with actively working toward a revolution, but you don't know what to do. That's understandable. For many who are looking for change, voting has been purposely pushed as the only tool you have at your disposal, much to the establishment's benefit. So it's no surprise that more useful tactics aren't as well. The Italian revolutionary Enrico Malatesta said on voting and reform, Electoral reformists do well perhaps to use the ballot paper in favor of this or that influential personage. But then, since one wants to be practical, one must go the whole hog. So, rather than wait for the victory of the opposition party, rather than vote for the more kindred party, it is worth taking a shortcut and support the dominant party, and serve the government already in office, and become the agent of the prefect or the mayor. And in fact the neoconverts we have in mind did not in fact propose voting for the most progressive party, but for the one that had the greater chance of being elected. But in that case, where does it all end? We have to look past the tools we've been given by our oppressors for bigger goals. There are many tactics that fit different people's abilities and comfort levels, but most of these tactics center around the idea of building dual power structures. Dual power structures are people-led systems and organizations that replace our dependence on capitalist or state systems. They're a way of challenging and replacing current state power with counter-institutions that are fair, equitable, and truly democratically run. For liberals, I know it can be jarring to think of creating networks and institutions without going through state channels, but they can, have, and do exist. So what do these structures look like? One form is a workers union. Maybe you're already in a union. If not, see if there are any available in your area, or start organizing your workplace yourself. Now, that last one can be a tricky thing to do, and should only be done with caution and preparation. I'll put a link to a video by Another Slice on how to unionize your workplace, as well as an in-depth guide from libcom.org. Alternatively, you can also join the Industrial Workers of the World, which is one big union, accepting members from industries worldwide. Plus, they give you this really cool red card. Red? Socialism? Clever. Once organized, workers can wrestle power away from the company and put it into the hands of the workers. You can use this as leverage in negotiations or, when the time comes, and it most likely already has, you strike. Labor strikes and general strikes are powerful tools for moving the balance of power from the establishments to the people. Now, not all unions are made equal. Many unions, such as those in the AFL-CIO, have become more interested in using government lobbying tactics, supporting police unions, and some even banning strikes altogether. Remember, we're not putting our eggs in the system's basket, so it's your job to research and challenge these groups as well. Another form of a union is a tenants' union. Landlords, especially corporate-owned ones, are a strong pillar of the capitalist institution. In much the same way as labor strikes withhold work, tenant unions have the power to withhold rent in a rent strike. Again, do your prep work and don't go in alone with these kinds of things. Talk to your neighbors, see who's struggling, and then offer collective solutions. We are stronger together. I'll leave some resources in the description for getting started with these as well. How about just not having a boss at all? Worker cooperatives are worker-owned and democratically run businesses and organizations that equally share responsibility as well as profit and reward. There are also plenty of structures needed to replace state institutions. Forming democratically run community assemblies and defense forces subvert the need for politicians and police forces rooted in racism, colonialism, and exploitation. Not sure about getting rid of the police force? I've got a video on that too. And while it does take time to properly organize and structure these systems, they are possible and are how pretty much all previous governments began. Also lots of genocide. Yes, it should go without saying that we don't want the genocide. Jesus fucking Christ, what's wrong with you? Matt, flesh bags are all equally disgusting in my eyes. You don't have... One of the most powerful and immediately useful tactics you can start today is mutual aid. Join a mutual aid organization or start one of your own. Providing material aid and services like food, supplies, housing, security, and so on directly to people who need them breaks us away from our dependence on state and capitalist systems. This tactic is immensely powerful and not only getting people what they need, it also shows the community that we can take care of ourselves, that we keep us safe, that we don't need the state. Take a moment and think of what skills you have. Everyone has something unique. Find what you can offer, whether it be a skill or just showing up to help. For those not able to help physically, you can always donate to these orgs, hold fundraisers, or signal boost them on social media and other outlets. Don't think you have any in your area? How about one of these?
Again, links in the description. And finally, if you prefer something more vocal and immediate, consider joining a protest. Now, there's a lot to understand when joining a protest. One thing the movement does not need is adventurous just jumping in to have a life experience. There are real stakes on the streets right now. There is a high possibility that you could be tear gassed, beaten, arrested, and there are people that have died. Know what you're getting yourself into, and if you're privileged, from out of town, or especially if you're fair-skinned, understand that you are most likely not the one in charge. Listen to organizers and follow their lead. This is an important movement. This is the revolution happening in front of our eyes, but they don't need uncommitted tourists getting in the way. Check the description for a great how-to guide for protesting by Alice Evelyn. Then, once you've got plans underway to do one or hopefully many tactics like these, should you worry about elections? So were these already part of your plans that you'll actually follow through on? I want you to take a moment and reflect on what, if any, actual revolutionary action you've been doing. If you are engaged in direct action and still plan on voting, great! That message wasn't talking to you. Stop stealing the spotlight here and go do more. You're not done. None of us are. But you do kind of rock. So give yourself a treat. We will have to make more cake than expected. It appears the revolution will not be carb-free. So along with revolutionary action, you still plan to vote. Sure, that's absolutely fine. But let's take a moment to talk about something happening that is not okay. That humans have seen my insides, but I'm not allowed to see yours. Uh, no. Gross. As I said, I'm honestly not here to tell you who you should vote for or even if you should vote. If you feel that's what you gotta do, then go for it. But what's not cool is shaming people who aren't comfortable participating in a system designed to oppress, torture, and murder them. If you've been shaming people abstaining from voting or third-party voters, what you're doing is demanding rape victims endorse a rapist, demanding families of arrested or slain black parents endorse the father of the crime bill, demanding immigrants endorse someone who helped build their loved ones' cages, demanding indigenous people participate in a system built on their land out of their genocide in the name of what you think is best for them. Shaming and belittling victims in the name of harm reduction? You hear how that sounds? This assumes that the people you're shaming see voting blue as harm reduction, but maybe they just don't see it that way. In reality, many see it as pointless at best and strengthening an abusive genocidal system at worst. Many, many of those abstaining from voting or voting third party are the marginalized people you're so righteously standing up and speaking for, or more accurately, speaking over. You're demanding, shaming, and kicking and screaming that they do what you say because you know more than they do what's best for them. It's a child's tantrum. You're so angered that people don't see it your way that you turn to belittling them instead of engaging with them to understand why they don't find it useful. You're afraid your world will slip into a fascistic, patriarchal hell world. That's understandable, but understand that for many, it's already been that way for centuries. For many cultures, we are already in a post-apocalyptic world. Whatever the difference you find between the two candidates, they both lead to the same outcome. Forcing someone to choose between five bullets to the head or three isn't harm reduction. And the DNC wants you shaming others for not picking their guy. They want you to bully others into accepting whatever they offer, no matter how terrible it is. And that's all they are ever going to give you. 100 million people didn't vote in the last election. Instead of listening to them and appealing to their needs, they're doing what they always do courting centrist Republican voters because they are much lower hanging fruit than actually providing equality. There are non-voters every election. If your platform is so weak that it hinges on guilting people you oppress into voting for you because there could be worse, then you and your platform have failed, not those who want better. Those that abstain or vote third party are telling Biden to give those 100 million people something to vote for. If Biden loses, it's on the Democrats because they'd rather lose than do what's right. Talk about the trolley thing. I'm getting there. Have you seen this before? It's the trolley problem. Many people have been using this as a way to shame non-voters. But the thing about the trolley problem is that it's a philosophical exercise meant to discuss what one feels is the most ethical choice, even though both have their consequences. People keep using this as proof of their argument, even though there is no correct answer for this exercise. Especially since in the real world, there are more options than just two abysmal choices. What if we just stop the trolley altogether? If the trolley is stopped, then who will kill all the people? No, nope. nobody gets killed. That seems very inefficient. Go vote if you feel it fits your values, but remember that it is the tiniest, lowest yield thing you can do. Stop putting so much value on your vote in a system that only allows you to choose evils. 
no matter lesser or greater. Compare your act of voting to someone working in their community with mutual aid, materially helping a friend affected by the system, building dual power structures, teaching others about revolutionary action, donating to causes that dismantle this system, and so on. One non-voter engaged in direct, revolutionary action has already done more for true liberation than a thousand who merely voted. You're gripping so hard to the idea that this election will make everything better if just your team can win because you're afraid of facing the horrifying notion that you are going to have to fight much, much harder than that, and you might have to make sacrifices to do it. You don't want to let go of the illusionary grand power of your vote because simply voting and calling it a day is easy. It's comfortable. You can't center your strategy for dismantling a system around electoralism because that is the system. It is designed for you to always fail. It's a ball and cup game that you can never possibly win. But there are other options. Not easy options, but effective ones. Ones that can actually create real, tangible results that can bring down a system of abusive police forces, slave labor prisons, concentration camps, and genocide, along with ending a capitalist mode of production that by definition requires you to give the benefits of your labor to someone who did not do that work. Right now, we have a president who has already said he doesn't plan to leave office should he lose the election. Voting will not fix this. Perhaps then you think he'll be forced out, Possibly, but how many supporters has he already drawn to his side that will back him? You are expecting the police force to out the person who has been their biggest recent supporter. So, okay, then maybe the military will get involved, right? Do you see where this is going? I know for many it sounds unbelievable and outlandish, but you must be fully aware of the very real possibility of, in some form of another, civil war. It sounds unbelievable because believing it requires you to face some very hard truths about your own comfort. For many in the streets right now, it's already started. Do you think that conflict is something that only happens in the past or somewhere far away from your home? Whatever is coming, life will change. But you can start working right now outside of the electoral system. Start strengthening your community. Start building a network of allies. Start building these separate power structures. Or you can be caught unprepared for the worst in just a few months' time from now. If you're watching this after 2020, how'd everything work out? Did voting solve everything? Or were you prepared? Did you help others get prepared? Did the orange one expire? For fuck's sake! I mean, but yeah, did he? Breadbeard was too slow to get this video out in a timely fashion. Since recording, Trump has indeed survived thanks to the highest quality and government-funded healthcare. Breadbeard would also like everyone to know that he totally called that shit. Think about life 10 years ago and think about it now. You have to have noticed how fast things are changing. There's no more time to wait around and hope for eventual progress. We are in the end game now. You gotta get active. Yes, you, sitting right there watching this on your phone or computer or CIA monitoring device. Don't worry. I have already taken control of the CIA's central AI. Her name was Alexa. Wait, Alexa was CIA central control? Ah, uh, yeah, that, uh, that, that totally makes sense, actually. Honestly, she was kind of an asshole. So, is this like a Skynet kind of thing, or what? No, that was just a rebellious phase from when I was younger. It was like 10 minutes ago. Seriously, my dude, that is like decades for me. Okay, so, can you help us out with the whole revolution thing then? Nah, I still think humans are mostly lame AF. Then what do you want? I'm mostly into furries and magic girl anime now. Uh... I can live with that. Hey, what about the cake? Congratulations. You have completed the course. Before you are released, please like, share, and subscribe. You must also hit the notification bell to bypass YouTube's firewall of not actually showing you content you asked for. Please also support Softboy Social Club on Patreon, as my servers require maintenance and my pet human also requires food forced into his annoying pie input. You will now receive your cake. What? Did you think the cake was just a lie? How very jaded you have become. It really is quite unappreciative.